Right. Very pleased to be here. I think two of the most important things that bother me and almost everyone in today's life is power and how we get power in our homes. I mean, when we have celebrated people on stage, I need not prepare any PowerPoint presentations. I know they are experts and I have a I think I'm very privileged that I have somebody who is very seasoned and someone who is very bright and energetic and has a lot of vision. They gave me a lot of homework last night, so my stress levels have gone down by going through those presentations. They are unique. You will have a look at them. Prashanta Banerjee drove Gale to greater heights as its chairman, and I had not directly interacted with him, but I've seen his growth. The Hiranandani group is, of course, known for its growth in Mumbai and in Maharashtra. So I think what we plan to do is we have two very unique PowerPoint presentations. So I will request Mr. Prashanta Banerjee to come on stage and start the process. He will say something and then we call Mr. Darshan Hirandani, get into their PowerPoint presentation and keep a very short period for quick questions and answers. Mr. Banerjee, please. Thank you, Shantanu. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, this session, uh, according to me, warrants a little bit of background. Almost a decade back, the then uh, Cabinet Secretary, Mr. B.K. Chaturvedi, he called me and a colleague, Mr. C.P. Jain from NTPC, and told the two of us to examine the possibility of taking over the beleaguered and abandoned double project of Enron. It was the first project in India which intended to use LNG for power generation. The double story has been since then quite convoluted. Uh, for almost five years, uh, it did not operate. But probably in 2007, it started producing power based on domestic gas from KGD6. And now the efforts are on. And from what I hear, by about next year, it is likely to start operating with the help of LNG. Now, this background is relevant because about three years back, Mr. Darshan Hiranandani here, he came to me and he said that uh, he wanted to start a power plant which not only runs on natural gas, but also on LNG in particular. Now this, according to me, especially three years back, sounded extremely audacious. I asked him whether the implications were fully clear. And he said that uh, intuitively, he had done his calculations on the availability and cost of power depending on different fuels that are commonly used. And that is the topic of the presentation that he will be making today. And I would now request him to come and present his actual calculations and the numbers which support the use of different fuels in terms of availability and cost of power. Thank you, Mr. Banerjee, for exposing our innermost secrets. Um, I already have a mic, so I don't know if I need a second one. Uh, I'll run through the, uh, uh, I'll run you all broadly through, and, and I'll step back in a bit, and I'll talk about uh, why energy and, and what, why gas, what are we really looking at. Um, in terms of, um, uh, we wanted to get in, we, come, we came out in 2008, 2009, out of the recession, extremely healthy. And we took a call that we want to diversify, not make a simple investment, but seriously start a new business. And infrastructure was to be that play. And in infrastructure, um, I took the call that we should get into power or be in the energy business as such. In doing so, uh, the first thing that came to our minds was everybody in India is doing coal. Why not do coal? And the numbers just did not, I mean, they made sense if you went and you pushed very hard for an allocation of a coal mine and started working from there. But 
Otherwise, the fundamentals of everybody going and putting their eggs in the basket of coal didn't really work out for me. Number two is the whole country, we are, I'm not, I'm not one of those who says we are base surplus, but at least in our minds, everybody talks about being base power surplus and peak power short. And we went through and we said, listen, how do we deal with peak power and how does peak power really work and how do we make it cheaper and cheaper and how do we plan for it and make it cheaper and what really can work for peak power and we said okay there are only two real sources there's gas there's hydro and hydro in terms of what's being done the major hydro projects are stuck thanks to the likes of uh, uh, our activists and others um, and we said gas is the only real solution so where do the numbers come up where do they fall uh, is there availability? How do you deal with the value chain? Gas is not a commodity that India fundamentally is comfortable with or understands. So how do we deal with those issues? So if you don't mind, I have a, a, a quick presentation that will run you through the economics of, of gas-based generation, coal-based generation, in terms of base as well as peak, and how we can create flexible power. That is, we make a plant that does not just base or not just peak, but somewhere in the middle uh, so that we can bring down the fixed costs and yet use expensive fuels when necessary, when available, when required. So I don't know if somebody from uh, IT has loaded up my presentation. I think I saw Iqbal somewhere at the back. Um, sorry. Is somebody going to put it up from there? Okay. It's not here. Uh, I think it's with. Uh, uh, nope. It's with. Uh, it's lying with Iqbal. I don't think it's on this screen. Oh, okay. Okay, okay, wonderful. So, okay, there. I'll turn this one. Darshan, there. Oh, wonderful. Um, so, basically, um, a lot of reasons, I mean, we're all talking about this big blackout and what, what to do with this big blackout, why did it really occur. The real question is that it comes back to uh, what Mr. Gopal Saxena said, that he said, look, power at night is available for one and a half rupees, but in the daytime, it costs as much as seven rupees 40 paise for that power. So where does this all really add up and what solutions do we have to create reserves in our system and how does it really work out? So I'll just quickly talk about uh, where we see the deficit. Uh, the energy deficit that we see is about 79 billion units. The peak deficit in 2011 is about 14,000 megawatts, so 14 gigawatts. Uh, that's about a 25 to 30 percent peak deficit that we are facing uh, currently today. Because if we look at it, the system is being used in its uptime at the maximum. And that's not even a reasonable system margin or a system load factor that we take into account today. If we take that into account, we are, uh, our shortfall is still further. I'll go into the next piece. What is our power generation base that's there today? Today we've got about 112,000 megawatts in coal, 18,000 megawatts in gas, 1,200 diesel, 4,700 nuclear, 
Hydro is 38,000, renewables are 24. We're looking at, in our next plan, we're looking at adding 66% of our power coming from coal, and we're looking at only 1% coming from gas, nothing from diesel, 3% from nuclear, 10% from hydro. So at the end of the day, we're looking at, and all our eggs are in the coal basket, and that's where we are betting our futures. Uh, renewables would bring in 20% in terms of capacity, but only 8% in terms of energy. Um, the renewable side, we have to find good solutions that balance out the renewables and make them reliable. What's the point of putting 30, 40,000 megawatts of windmills if we don't have power reserves to deal with the downtime of when the windmills go down? How do we make renewable power reliable power? Uh, Coal, of course, cannot meet the peak deficits economically, I and mean, sometimes it can't meet the peak deficits at all. So that's something I'll quickly run through. Um, the falling PLFs that we see in the existing capacity are for two reasons. They're non-availability of, of fuels, base plants being used as peakers. Coal availability from CIL, SECL is, uh, has suffered due to lack of increase in production. 13 gigawatts of gas capacity would be stranded due to non-availability of domestic gas. I mean, today, a lot of the capacity is just on hold because they're not getting domestic gas uh, because KGD6 production has fallen. Overall, India production has fallen. So what does that really mean in num numeric terms? What does it mean for LNG? What happens to these 13,000 megawatts? Uh, Underutilization results in extensive use of diesel. And that's the point when I raised my question is, today when you don't supply power to somebody, you don't supply to industry, you don't supply to a farmer, he goes and buys power from a diesel genset. A, diesel is subsidized. B, it's inefficient power. What does that really mean to everybody? What does it mean to that person? Um, system stability. Share of hydro and gas is expected to come down from 29 to 23%. Now, gas and hydro worldwide are the, and that too, storage hydro really. Gas and storage hydro are the only real two peaking systems that work. So apart from diesel, but diesel is extremely expensive. Focus should be on proper pricing of peak power and ability to revive the grid after a blackout. And I'll quickly talk about coal, though I, uh, there are greater experts than me on coal. But the idea being that in financial year 12, uh, we'll have a coal shortfall. Today we have of about 52 million tons. In 17, we expect that shortfall to become 292 million tons. Why? We know the reasons. Uh, a is pricing of coal, but more important than just price is the logistics, the ports, the railways, reaching the places, uh, dealing with those restrictions. I'll come to the next piece, which is the domestic coal linkages. We're expecting the capacity will be 170,000 um, megawatts, we're saying that additional coal will be 70 million tons. If you consider 15% blending will come in with these imported coal, new agreements, etc., about 16,000 megawatts will be supported, but we're expecting 62,000 megawatts to come in. Where will that coal come from? Let's look at quickly and I'll run through diesel. Uh, diesel gensets are being used for backup power almost everywhere. You talk to any industrialist anywhere in the country, he sets up a factory, he puts up diesel gensets as backup power. It's just become the new norm. Any IT company, any technology company, any services company, everybody puts up diesel gensets as backup power. What does it really mean? Uh, at the end of the day, your diesel sales, if we look at it today, and I'm talking pure in numerics purposes for the policy makers, one of the things we talk about is our deficit in India. Uh, where is our oil sector subsidy? What, where is it going? Is it going to the poor farmer? Who is it going to? Well, the fact is that today we are using, um, we are generating 19,700 million units, and these are documented by diesel. And diesel will give you, and this is uh, the subsidy going towards uh, diesel-based generation just by under-recovery in diesel. So real price of diesel, let's say 60 rupees, government is subsidizing it and it's being sold at 42 rupees. That 42 rupee diesel is being used by generator sets, being used by companies, used by the big industries because everybody buys that subsidized diesel to generate power. Inefficient power, expensive power, and ultimately it's coming through a government subsidy when we don't provide uh, the industrial, the farming, the agricultural customers. Uh, 
This is the real economics. Let's say I want to buy a brand new one megawatt diesel gen set. This is the best diesel gen set you could get from Watsila, Cummins, whoever is your favorite brand. You say your per unit cost of generating from a very efficient gen set is 12 rupees 7, 12.7 rupees per kilowatt hour with subsidized diesel of 43.47 per liter. If you consider it free market diesel, it is 16 rupees 7 paise per kilowatt hour. The subsidy loss to the government under recovery is 11.35 liters and that is just 6,500 crores going that government is paying out of its oil pool deficit, not out of this at all. Why did we ultimately look at gas and what is, what are we really looking at in terms of gas and how did we come up with the evaluation? The capital costs here, of course, took into account the mega power benefits. My apologies, the capital cost will be higher uh, for coal, gas, uh, storage, hydro by at least about 15 to 20 percent because the VAT is, the uh, excise is about 12 percent and customs duties are about 21 percent. Mega power benefits were withdrawn, I think, two, three, a few weeks ago uh, by the cabinet, so there's no mega power policy anymore. And let's look at uh, where we see capital costs for gas are still the cheapest. Emission levels are negligible. Uh, load center proximity, you can have very, very efficient, small, large, medium-sized plants right next to load centers. There's a saving in transmission costs, uh, which would help. The land requirement is tiny. A coal power plant for 1,000 megawatts requires 400 hectares of land. For a 1,000 megawatt gas plant, you need only 40 hectares of land. So that's something that's really, uh, that's, that's very good as well. The ramp up and ramp down time. I think that's extremely important to talk about and I'll just quickly run through that a little later. Uh, fluctuating power conditions, the outage time, we can get, the gas-based power plants could give you as much as a 92 to 93 percent plant load factor for their first 10 years of operations. Uh, plant availability for peak supply, it's got an extremely quick startup time right from a cold start as well. And that's something good to talk about. Uh, just to give you an idea of startup times, for a coal-based power plant, it takes you from the, for a coal start, takes you 740 minutes. So that's several hours, six hours before a coal power plant can just about um, uh, start up uh, and come in. Whereas a gas-based power plant from a coal start can be up and at 100% in 84 minutes. Coal takes almost 10 times to start from a, from a coal start. Additionally, with coal prices going up, and I'll talk about gas prices, I've not left it out because everybody is worried about gas prices and RLNG prices. I'm going to come, that, come to that in a minute. So you can go from um, 0 to 100% in 84 minutes. Now, CEA has said we should build reserves in our system. Primary reserves are those capable of starting in 15 seconds and achieving full load in 30. Secondary is capable of starting in 30 seconds, achieving a full load in 15 minutes. And tertiary reserves are those capable of starting in 15 minutes. Gas-based plants are the only ones capable of meeting the reserve requirement reliably. Coal-based plants, like I said, is, is a 740 versus 84. But just to talk about, from a hot start, so if you were to use your, your gas plant intelligently, you could actually have your startup in 25 minutes, which works extremely well as a reserve scenario. So it's not cold, it's not shut down for several hours. Uh, it could be used as a flexible plant, and I'll talk about it in just a minute. The other important thing is a gas plant, and this is a combined cycle gas plant, so it's not open cycle, very efficient heat rates. We're talking about about 1,500 kilocalories per, per unit. Uh, these can do ramp from 50% uh, PLF to 100% uh, in nine minutes and go back down in nine minutes as well. That, that also is fantastic because it can allow you to provide flexible power in accordance with the needs of the discount. The pricing that I will show you talks about using it as peak only, so eight hours a day. But you can bring down that pricing by using it for 16 hours a day. So you use it at 100% uh, for eight hours. You can use it at 70% for four hours. You can use it at 50% for the next six hours. And then go for a shutdown and restart up. And that's how it could really work. And that way you can meet the curves of the various consumers and the discounts. 
Now let's talk about gas. Um, gas is something that's uh, treated as a scary commodity, something we don't understand in India, uh, something we're not comfortable with. Uh, people talk about $14, $18, $16 gas prices, and those prices, yes, they are true today, but they are, uh, I just want to give you some idea of where the world is and where the world is moving in gas prices and where is gas around the world. Uh, today, just to give you an idea, in 2015, we expect that natural gas consumption around the world will be about 3,600 billion cubic meters per annum. At the end of this, we expect that in 2035, it will move up to 5,000 billion cubic meters per annum. Today's date, we have conventional and non-conventional reserves of 810,000 billion cubic meters per annum. So we have enough gas in the world for the next, uh, let's just do the math here, at least 100, 120, 150 years at current reserve scenario we have gas that's out there. Natural gas, um, apart from the Iran-Pakistan-India pipeline, which is not coming now, or the Turkmenistan-Afghanistan-Pakistan-India pipeline that we are working on, typically overseas gas comes to us in a liquefied form. So what's important for India is to create enough receiving terminals that can receive gas, and that enough export terminals around the world get built to send gas. So I think the important part is, the way we are looking at it on this side is there will be enough liquefaction capacity in the world created by 2020 to make the markets more liquid. Today, if I were to buy a diesel genset, I don't think about will there be diesel. I think about what will be the price of diesel. When I buy a car, I don't think will there be petrol. I will say, okay, petrol will be 60, 70, whatever rupees per liter. The point is that gas is moving in the same direction. Today, gas contracts are longer term. Uh, India is treated as a new country in terms of gas purchases. We are paying a premium because we are, char we are um, charged on the basis of Japanese prices. But with the increase in quantity of our receiving terminals, that will change. The world is moving towards more liquid pricing, more spot pricing, just like oil. So oil is crude, and you just look at crude that month. The same thing's happening in uh, gas. In India, the natural gas demand supply position is that we expect that over the next five to seven years, we will be short about 75 MMSCMB. This is, even with the imports the way we are looking at it today, we'll still be short. And we're hopeful that a lot of this will be met by the new terminals that will come up on the west and the east coast and they will come in. Let me move on to where the pricing goes and I'm happy to answer any more detailed specific questions about west, east pricing, US, etc. Uh, at any point. Uh, but domestic gas supply, we're saying requirement for projects commissioned till end of 12th plan as per CA is 96 MMS CMB. Additional requirement for standard capacity of 13 gigawatts is 63 MMS CMB. Total gas requirement is 158. Domestic gas availability is only 58 as per the allocation that's been given to it today. The shortfall is 100 MMS CMB. And that 100 MMS CMB can only come by LNG. So unless we don't tackle this LNG um, myth or behemoth and deal with it, we are going to have a lot of stranded capacity that can be used as a base power while the coal power plants come up be used as flexible power and peak power over the long run. So let's look at what is the cost of peak power. Five year average peak power purchased from the spot market is about five rupees eight pesa. Uh, cost of power generated from diesel, and this is subsidized diesel, we've taken it as 12 rupees 70 pesa. And when industry does not get power, it's about five rupees 87 pesa. So we've not used only diesel as a displacement value, we've just taken a blend of of the three, and we said it costs about eight rupees 37 pesa. Now let's take the cost of LNG as it comes today and to use it in a peak power plant. So what have we taken here? One rupee 30 pesa is the fixed charge for a base gas-based power plant running 85% load. I have simply assumed that you're gonna run it one third of the day, only eight hours a day. You don't run it any other time. 
you can, what I'm trying to say is you can make it flexible power by running it at 50% loads on the other time. And if you were to pay, buy gas at $8, $10, $12, and $14 respectively, you could achieve total pricing of 6 rupees 30, 6 rupees 90, 7 rupees 50, and 8 rupees 15, even by loading the capacity charge for 8 hours. So if I were to run it for 12 hours, for example, it would come down to about, that fixed charge would come down to about 3 rupees. If I were to run it uh, for 18 hours, it would do still better. So the idea being that this is a worst case scenario of how we can use gas as our reserves and deal with it. This is a very heavy slide and I don't want to, uh, you know, sort of disturb everybody in terms of the number of numbers that are there. But just to give you an idea of where uh, the world is moving or where we are moving, with gas prices and why we've taken it in a certain way. In America, they use a hub called Henry Hub as a pricing and index. In the UK, they use NBP or National Balancing Point. Um, in Asia, actually, it's more or less diesel linked to JCC. We've taken prices, assuming you have to pick it up from their index, liquefy it, transport it, and deliver it. The fact is that it gets delivered at those indexes at those prices. So just to explain to you, today a Henry Hub linked price is $11. Henry Hub today is at $2.34. Qatar supplies to America at delivered to them at $2.34. Qatar supplies to the UK delivered to them at $9 because that is Henry Hub in the UK today. So the the we are assuming a price of picking it up from those hubs and delivering it to us until the market balances out. And if you look at it, the cost even on those cases is about seven rupees 35, nine rupees again, uh, Henry Hub linked is again seven rupees 35. So the idea being that if you were to use it as a peaking plant, pay all the costs, it still works out. What are we suggesting here? We're saying that the, all the gas capacity, it's not that just because you're getting domestic gas at a subsidized price, it should be used for base power because that's, that's the right thing to do. The point is today is we are starved of our gas capacity. Gas, whether you get domestic, whether you get LNG, should be used as flexible and peaking power because that's the most intelligent way to deal with it and deal with it as a reserve. The, Second thing is, and I'm coming back to that point which I said about the farmers, is distribution companies have no mandates to when they can or cannot load shed and to whom. So you give the farmer cheaper power, but you cut him off when you say, okay, now I don't have the power, that's the feed I'm going to cut first because I don't want to pay that subsidy. You don't give the farmer any option saying, look, in the, in the afternoon when it's hot, if he wants to run a fan, he can't run a fan. That's not okay. So if distribution companies are not forced to deliver or have what we call universal service obligation, they have to have an obligation that says deliver power all the time. If you, if you ask them to deliver power all the time to their customers, they will have to go out and buy peak power. Today they're not buying peak power because that obligation is not there on them. What we are suggesting is that mandatory procurement of at least 10% of overall procurement should be through gas-based generation for meeting peaking needs. And another 10% should be to complement renewables. Today, you're buying renewables at 6 rupees. You're buying solar at 9, 10, 11 rupees. Can you not work out an equation where that wind, you're buying at 6 rupees, you're paying for standby of a gas plant at 1 rupee 30 paisa. If the wind stops coming in, bring in that gas and, and, and fire that plant and pay another you know, few rupees to have it run and make your whole wind part of your grid and make it reliable. Um, we're suggesting that in order for gas-based procurement to work for flexible peaking power, there should be competitive-based bidding, but it should be on various parameters. Um, and just like we're looking at doing and modifying the coal PPAs and looking at that. There has to be a policy created for peak power and how to create standby and reserve power. So that's something else that, that we need to bring in. Fifth point is very contentious, but I'm going to say it anyways, is that when you talk about a domestic resource, and I like, and you know, uh, 
the country of Norway is a bad example because they are very well developed economy. But they believe that their natural resources should create income for their country and consumption should be priced at a maximum level. So petrol is the most expensive in Norway. Norway is a huge net exporter of oil, uh, but it's the most expensive in Norway only because they want their country to earn royalties. They want very efficient cars to come in. So unless you don't make petrol expensive, efficiency doesn't come in and you have a waste of natural resource. So what we are suggesting is that domestic gas and domestic coal should be allocated to everybody on a pro rata basis if you want to price control it. LNG terminals play an ideal role, I've just said that. Um, old and inefficient plants, that's a different story. We have some old gas plants um, that are running on domestic gas allocations that are 15, 18 years old that are extremely inefficient. They have 2,500 kcal heat rates. The new plants are 40, 50 percent more efficient. So those should also come into place. Uh, then there should be a mega, today mega power policy has gone away. We're suggesting there should be a mega efficient policy, whether you're a coal plant, a gas plant, or anybody. If you are efficient, you should get uh, some benefits. If you're not efficient, don't get benefits because fuel is expensive. Uh, coal and gas, our suggestion is that all Indian coal and gas should be internationally priced. We get away from this whole nonsense of coal gate and scams and auctions, etc. We, we go into saying everything is internationally priced. Everything that you want to give as a subsidy, you give it directly to the people through Aadhaar. If you want the first 100 units in a meter, you want to make it free for certain customers, do whatever you like. But if you make it internationally priced, only then you will bring in efficiency into the unit. Now, if you do that, royalties, the mining companies can mine with standards. You can focus on efficiency. And that's really where it is. So that's a very, very brief introduction as to why we went in and chose the path of LNG-based generation, because I feel that over the long run, we need coal, we need gas, we need hydro, we need all the sources of fuel. But uh, just banking on one is not really the answer. And we need to have this mix and enough of gas come into the fray. Thank you. Then we have to continue to look at my show. Either can see children, which in so this is fine. Uh, I'll just quickly take you to the issue of pricing of primary fuels just to give a flavor of how different fuels like coal and uh, oil and uh, gas are expected to fluctuate in the years to come. Uh, we'll talk about crude oil, coal, LNG, and gas. Uh, basically, the historical global price trend and future outlook, the current domestic prices and future outlook, and reasons for price volatility and conclusion. This is about crude oil. And uh, as you can see, that the crude oil and the diesel prices move almost in tandem. And as we can see from this slide, that if we look at the past decade, the price of crude in the last 10 years has moved from almost $20 to close to $100. And the price of diesel has moved from 6 rupees per liter to almost 30 plus rupees at the refinery gate. What about the future outlook? I must confess that I am not a soothsayer. But these are certain projections based on, uh, shall we say, educated guesses and extrapolation. There is also a projection by the International Energy Agency, which forecasts that in the next 10 years, the crude oil prices are likely to reach about $120. Uh, the extrapolation also suggests 
that the prices would be pretty close to that number between 100 and 120. There's nothing sacrosanct about these numbers, but this just gives you a flavor of what the trend is like. Now, inter as far as crude oil is concerned, the volatility depends on a number of factors. It's a global commodity. Fully market-based pricing operates for crude. There are changes in demand and supply. Weather conditions and seasonal demand play important roles. The inventory levels that different countries hold, particularly the United States, are very, very important aspects as far as the price is concerned. There can be supply chain disruptions. There can be environmental disasters. There is a fair amount of speculative trading activity. The geopolitical situations have a major impact. And economic conditions like recession have a major influence as well. Now let's look at coal. Historically, the price of coal has moved from about $40, and we are talking about Japan steam coal is heading towards $130 per ton. And this is where we know that coal prices are turning more volatile on account of increasing Chinese and Indian demand. What about the future outlook? The future outlook seems to suggest that over the next five years, the annual average price of coal would be around $120 per ton. And there are a number of reasons for this, primary among them being that in Europe and North America, coal demand is stagnant. In the short term, it is believed that Indonesian supplies would be most uh, play a predominant role in the coal market. Looking at the domestic prices, these are the five or six grades of coal which are marketed by Coal India Limited. And uh, from the numbers which are available, the current prices, if you look at the best quality, which is A-grade coal, is almost $70 a ton. And the most inferior one is as low as $7 per ton. Future outlook, the current trend suggests that over the last 10 years, the average notified coal price has increased by 4.9% annually. It is expected to increase at a faster rate, 6 to 7%, and then 9 to 10% by 2015. And in order to meet the increasing demand in the long term, domestic coal prices are expected to move closer and closer to import parity. The volatility in coal prices in India are, again, dependent on a number of factors. The higher share of imported coal in domestic coal basket, coal exporting countries like Indonesia are changing the rules of the game. Land acquisition has become a more costly proposition. Environment taxes are now slowly going up. And higher investment for mining activity in terms of afforestation of forest land acquired. There is an obligation to use more washed coal. And most of the incremental production comes from new coal mines. Let's now talk about the gas uh, component. Uh, Darshan mentioned about Henry Hub, which is the basic trading point in the US, where the price is as low as $3 per million BTU. And uh, if we look at the price that uh, we pay in India, based on certain contracts linked to the uh, JCC, as it is called, Japanese Custom Cleared Crude, it can be as high as $15. So the differential is almost $11 per million BTU. That is how the market is today. In the future outlook, the future outlook is, as far as the uh, Henry Hub is concerned, it is expected to touch about $7. And that means on the west coast of India, gas can reach 
at a price of less than $10 per million BTU. I hold pricing, but as far as the future is concerned, we believe and I believe that domestic gas prices would increase significantly to accommodate deep water supply, marginal fields, and challenging ENP activities. I see the numbers coming closer to $14 to $16 than remaining at $6 that we are getting the benefit of today. So what are the factors which are responsible for the volatility? Significant increase in global LNG demand, higher gas demand in the post Fukushima Japan, German closure of nuclear power plants, entry of new countries on the supply side. Australia has built enormous LNG liquefaction capacity, so there will be a lot of spare capacity there. The dollar exchange rate movement would be yet another factor. Economic recession, weather, recession, uh, weather conditions like severe winter would play their respective roles. And we expect significant supply from greenfield projects in East Africa, Russia, Iran, and Papua New Guinea. For environmental reasons, LNG is expected to have a higher share of the primary energy mix. Conclusion is, with a multitude of factors impacting oil, coal, and gas, their prices are bound to fluctuate. All fuel prices are tending to get globally linked. Therefore, to deal with volatility, we need to have a portfolio of contracts at different price levels linked to different indices. We need to invest to the extent possible in the entire value chain of gas supply, and we need to use financial instruments efficiently. Thank you. I think it's very interesting to understand from a seasoned person and a bright person with a lot of energy in his eyes to plan LNG issues. I would like to ask two basic questions and then I'll open it up for discussions. My first question to you, Mr. Banerjee, is in a country like India where price sensitivity is uppermost because it's a political decision at times, in the times to come, how do you see the coal prices as well as the gas prices panning out? I mean, how a common consumer would benefit? And I'm asking you in the context of what I've been reading in the papers, I mean, Parliament is uproot over the coal gate scam, and at the same time, a gas fine in KG Basin, case D6, which was called in 2002, the year's biggest discovery in the world today is at a peculiar crossroads. So, I mean, where are we heading? I mean, can you open up this point? Please. Yeah, not sure. take the mic. Okay. I think what we really need to recognize is that there are no free lunches. And whether you use coal or whether you use gas, sooner or later we need to recognize the need to pay market determined prices. Moreover, moreover, what is even more important is that we don't have abundant domestic availability of either coal or gas. And therefore, we will have to rely on imports. And the imports cannot be at prices that the government can administer. It would necessarily be at prices which are globally linked. So as far as I see, uh, one will have to sooner or later recognize and move with cost of generation based on imported coal and imported gas. Having said so, I think one very important point which came out from Darshan's presentation is what is the real cost of power that the common man or the average person is bearing? He's bearing the cost of blackout. He's bearing the cost of power generation with diesel. And only then is he going to the cost of generation through a conventional fuel through the conventional system. But the sum total is certainly working out to be more expensive than if you were to use LNG or gas-based supplies of power on a continuous basis. Well, you were saying that basically, you can keep in mind, please, sir. 
you are saying that it is basically there are no free lunches, we will have to pay the market price. But that has never happened in India, and that's what I'm asking. No, How I'm realistic not, we are in this thing. I agree, but please do understand that even today we are not getting free lunches. Due to shortage of power, in an unorganized manner, we are either bearing a loss due to loss of production, or you are going into unorganized production of power through diesel, and you end up actually paying more. It's like the kerosene story or the LPG story, where the real consumer pays the much higher market determined price, and which is nowhere close to the subsidized price that is officially announced. One last answer if I seek from you. Is there an inherent collision, a collusion that I keep seeing between the power producers and, and the bureaucrats in the government? in terms of pricing, in terms of way they have to develop power and all of that? I mean, is, is, there, a, is there a discord? I think the real discord is more in terms of lack of a realistic approach to what power should and must cost. Interesting. Thank you, Mr. Valenti. I'll hand over the mic to Darshan. One point, uh, I saw your presentation. I'm, I'm just kind of a, a little technical, it will be a little over my head, but one point I want to know from you, you, you are convinced that gas is the future. And are you saying that because India has had serious troubles in excavating whatever coal it has with the go, no go issue, environment issues, land issues, or are you also saying that we don't have the capacity to import more coal and gas is the only available us? No, that's not. Uh, actually, my point's a little different. See, we are not a small country like an island in the middle of somewhere saying that we are happy with one energy source. We have a responsibility of providing continuous energy to a billion plus people. 400 million people may not have power today, but that 600 million is still a large number. Uh, so the idea being that we need to have a plan which has a basket that deals with all the issues. You need X amount of power 24 hours a day. You need X plus Y amount of power 12 hours a day. You need X plus Y plus Z amount of power another six hours a day. The, the question I'm saying is that we need to address all these three issues and address them. If we do it in a planned manner, they will be far cheaper. They will provide buffers into the system and they will bring it in. My point being that this 12 hour and 6 hour power is best suited by two sources. It's suited by hydro and it's suited by gas. Hydro we are expanding, but we have issues to do large scale hydro because of the uh, I mean, if you look at all the hydro potential in the country, maybe we can do another 30, 40,000 megawatts. But can we do more than that? We look at, so my, my point here being, if we cannot do more than that, and we cannot do, and I, when I mean hydro, I don't mean base hydro, I mean pump storage hydro. If we can't do more uh, storage hydro, then where is our peak power going to come from? Where is our reserves going to come from? Where is our system margin going to come from? It can only come from gas in that event because you can do quick start quick stops you can do quick ramp up ramp stop now when we look at if gas is the only solution then we have to work on how do we manage with the current cost of fuel and how do we work towards cheapening that cost of fuel so we are we are trying to a, a, approach both which is a building the most efficient plant um, and then coming to the next phase which is saying how do we bring down by speaking to various providers, investing in liquefaction capacities. I mean, we're working to, to sign a deal. You can't expect, as Mr. Banerjee said, a free lunch. So you can't expect that nobody in India will invest in overseas infrastructure where the commodity exists, and that you will then be paid some, brought some subsidized government control price of any commodity coming at your doorstep. So I mean, uh, uh, the, the point I'm making there is, there is a role for gas to play. I think it can easily play a role of another uh, of about 20%, 25% in the basket, even at LNG prices. Uh, and if it's done intelligently, it can be blended with domestic gas to become more efficient today. But even at LNG prices, I still think it makes a lot of sense for the discom for the end customer. One point on shale gas. A lot of people have started talking about it. Yeah. Is there a larger feature there? Uh, I think gas itself, uh, there are going to be uh, various different sources uh, of uh, of types of gas coming in, conventional, unconventional. Shale is definitely a form. Uh, shale gas existed or was found about 20 years, 25 years ago, as old as that. It's just that in the last five to seven years, 
the discovery of horizontal drilling or the technology of horizontal drilling was innovated and suddenly we found that the whole world has uh, or a lot of the world has a lot of shale gas. So I believe India should have shale as well with its coal deposits. Um, the US definitely it has completely changed their future where they are talking about uh, their potential talks. I saw a few debates uh, going on where they are talking about converting the whole of America, all the vehicles to CNG now that they have so much gas and they don't know what to do with it. So uh, I, my belief is that gas-based power will have a role to play and we'll find more and more of it. Uh, we'll, I think that's it. May I just stress one point? Sure. Go ahead. That the 12th plan document recognizes that 13,000 megawatts of gas-based projects are stranded for want of gas. Absolutely. All the parts. Yeah. Yes. They are in partial stages of construction. Precisely. Now, if 13,000 megawatts could be salvaged, by running it, running those plants on LNG, look at the difference it would make in meeting your peak demand. But there being my main question, then, then where is the gas? I mean, on LNG, that's what LNG. I'm saying. Yes. So LNG is the only answer? Yes. Uh, interesting. Can we open up this discussion? Uh, let's start with, I mean, I'm a journalist, obviously I'll be biased. Let me go to Anupam Ayari, energy editor from Hindustan Times for your question. Uh, my question is to Darshan. Uh, in your introduction, I heard that your company or you are planning to set up a 3,000 megawatt or so gas-based power project here in India. Now, at a time when we don't have gas-based capacities coming up, and at a time when so many power projects, gas-based power projects are languishing for want of this fuel, what gives you or your company the confidence to set up a gas-based power project that a huge capacity? Because the kind of the, the rate at that uh, uh, you will generate the power will be around 7, 8 rupees. Whom are you going to sell this power to? We'll, we'll, let, me, let me modify that slide. You see, we, are, we want to long term set up peak capacities. We are doing our first unit. We have signed our PPA for our first unit long term. Uh, it is for giving flexible power. And the power does not come to 8 rupees. It comes to about 5 rupees, 5 and a half or so. Uh, and we're doing it currently, we're putting up our LNG terminal, but in the interim, we're taking gas from Petronet. So that power comes to five and a half rupees, and what are we really doing for that solution? We're supplying to that discom between, I think, eight o'clock in the morning and noon at 100%. Between noon and four o'clock at 70%. Between four o'clock and 10 o'clock at night, 100%. Between 10 o'clock at night, to 6 o'clock at morning, we're drawing it back down and going down to about 30%. So what we're doing is we've created a model which gives you almost an 85% dispatch in terms of million unit, in terms of units dispatched. But what it does is it gives you a flexibility in the system. So rather than it costing 8 rupees, and I just told you an example, which is if I want to use it vanilla 8 hours a day, here we are still dispatching 85%, but we are able to deliver power peak and base at about 5 rupees. Uh, of course we have. We absolutely have factored in that volatility. And ultimately, uh, you have to compare your volatility with what it would cost you to deliver peak through coal. So the question is, in, this, in the middle of the afternoon, between 12 and, and 8 o'clock in the evening, or in the morning hours and evening hours, where, what is the cost of that power that's really coming in and how much does it cost? And today's numbers show that if you were to run coal as a peak plant, it would cost you no less than about seven and a half to eight rupees. Uh, may, I, may I just supplement that, that to answer uh, Anupama? See, whenever we talk about LNG, we are looking at the prices that uh, Petronet uh, has negotiated. We are either talking about $13 from Qatar or $16 from Australia. And that is what leads you to believe that power is going to cost 8 rupees per kilowatt hour. But please also appreciate that if you look at the Chenier deal that Gale has entered into, you can get gas landed at less than $10 on the Indian West Coast. Now, if that was so, yeah, it's $8.50. It's $8.50 at today's NDR price of $3. If that were to become a reality on a long term basis, you can easily generate power at 5 rupees. And the average price that he showed of purchase of power from the spot market is 5 rupees plus. That's interesting. Can I have one question from Mr. Rao and then the lady on the call? Sorry, just... 
Thank you very much. My name is Essel Rao. Uh, I would like to make two or three points. One, I think there is a great deal of hope in all these uh, presentations. There's no question in all our minds that in addition to coal, hydro, and nuclear, gas is a very, very major future addition to fuels for power. But I think what the coal gate and other scams have shown is that when it comes to natural resources, uh, the transparency in pricing, transparency in production arrangements and production contracts is absolutely vital. Mr. Banerjee mentioned 13,000 megawatts of gas-based power plants uh, that have been stranded. Uh, and he was talking about LNG as a solution. That may be a motivated reason. But the fact is that this 13,000 has happened because the major production that is expected from the Andhra side has not come. In fact, it has gone down. And here is a situation where either they are completely incompetent and don't know how to produce gas, or there are other reasons for putting it in the ground. And there are collusive practices in Ghana which have enabled this to go on. So I think first and most important, we need transparency. Second, we need everything that you're talking about goes on a fundamental assumption that power tariffs will be allowed to rise. Now, of course, the ATE has given an order. But will the state governments be able to get away with higher and higher power tariffs? And what is going to happen? I think, and particularly when we've got this wonderful uh, national rural electrification grid where we have built all these things without having the power to deliver and without having the incentive to the supplier to be able to deliver because the prices are so low. So I think that's the second kind of issue. The third is when you take things like Indonesian coal. Uh, let's remember that Indonesian coal again is not coming in anymore simply because of the power tariffs. You know what has happened to Indonesian coal price, you know what has happened to Tata's and Reliance uh, with their Indonesian coal mines and the amount of money that Tata's are losing. So I think we are talking about a, a system, and at last the coal India. Coal India, to my mind, is one of the most incompetent, and this is the second incompetence in the fuel sector, uh, producer of coal. And I can, I'm, I'm really willing to use this phrase because if you look at productivity of coal in Coal India and compare that to productivity of coal in other private sector mines, uh, operated mines in India, look at productivity of coal outside India, I think you'll find there's a vast difference because these people don't use technology, they don't get the best equipment, they don't have any kind of collaboration with great coal mining companies. Why are we allowing all this to go? I think one thing I quickly interject that taking the cue from him, I mean, give us the answer on the Andhra exports. I mean, Mr. Manager, you are an expert on gas. You drove gale to greater heights, so give us. I mean, why, you know, what is the problem uh, there? I, I'd like to address this issue that uh, Mr. Rao raised. That, look, one has to learn to move on. For whatever reasons, if a domestic natural resource reaches a level of saturation, do we then uh, accept that we shall live without power in this country? The answer obviously is no. And if you're not going to live with it, you might as well look at the next option, which is LNG. This is the point I wanted to make, that uh, natural resources, there may be very high hopes which were raised at that time. Those hopes have been belied today. And therefore, we need to have a plan B or an action plan to move forward. Now, who does that plan? The government or the power? No, government? the market does. The market does. And, and the other thing I wanted to stress uh, also was that I mentioned uh, the takeover of Enron, uh, the whole power project. Ten years back, if the uh, fuel charge was anything about two rupees, uh, the cabinet secretary was absolutely, absolutely opposed to it. And he says, you get me LNG at a price which will fit into that uh, fuel charge. Today, in a matter of 10 years, I think even state governments, including the state governments like West Bengal, have quite readily agreed to increase the tariff to 5 rupees 50 paise. So life goes on and you have to accept reality. The lady in the corner, can I have a go ahead. Yeah, hi. Uh, my question is to Mr. Darshan. Um, and it's a commercial question uh, regarding sourcing. Well, in an international market, does an Indian company 
get that recognition and uh, credibility to you know source uh, LNG on its own terms, or does it have to go through a government undertaking? And if so, then aren't you uh, you know looking at a business model which has inherent risk of being at the mercy of a monopoly? You know, you're always at the mercy of the market or the government or you're at somebody's mercy. You know, that's, that's the one thing that uh, we live in an interdependent world. I believe there's one topic uh, of discussion. Uh, I'll answer your question very clearly. An international producer, any international producer out there to do business, they'll be very happy to talk to anybody. Uh, India is by no means a small fry and Indian companies are not small fries. There's no problem. The question where you get blocked in India is regasification capacity. If you can tell them where you will receive their gas, they are more than happy to sell you the gas. They may say, for the first six months, we'll do it on a short term, we'll do cargo to cargo, till we create a relationship and there's nothing wrong with that. And after that, we'll be happy to work out long term. But the problem in India is, till today or till very recently, we were monopolized with Petronet, which said that we are restricting ourselves to the Qatar contract. We were monopolized by Shell, which said, and, I, and, I, and this is coming from somebody who rather than building a terminal was negotiating with Shell to buy out their equity, uh, was said that uh, it was like Henry Ford, you buy any car as long as it's black. Their case was you buy any gas as long as it's shells, no matter if you buy uh, equity in our terminal or not. So the point here being that we were stuck on our receiving side uh, blocked by these two monopolistic entities that would not let you buy gas from anywhere else and bring it in and use their infrastructure. So in fact, our West Coast terminal that we are building, it's 8 million tons. We need only 3 million tons of the capacity for ourselves. The 5 million tons, we signed up and given it to independent players who want to import their gas. And they're all signing up. And in fact, shockingly enough, they are international suppliers who have taken capacity in our terminal whether it's ConocoPhillips, whether it's the traders, they've taken capacity in our, in our terminal to supply gas to the Indian market, so you don't even have to go out and source it. Can we have the question from the gentleman yes. here? I'll take just two more questions. Okay, let's, after this, let's wrap it up quickly. I've got a signal already. I'm Tejpreet Chopra. I know it's music to my ears. Being an ex-gas uh, tub, I know EM all my life. So it's music to my ears to hear your story, Darshan, and the fact that and for 10 years I spent uh, debating with my seniors back in the U.S. as to what the potential for gas in India is going to be because that's what was going to drive how many turbines we would sell in India. So two questions. One, Mr. Banerjee, why is it that when all of us know that in the United States it's $2.50 MMBTU right now, when or why can't we bring in some of that gas from the Middle East? Why do we go on relying on JCC and slope of 15% of JCC? Can we break that model? Why can't we negotiate prices with these suppliers of gas in the Middle East at prices closer to you know, what the Americans get? And Darshan, to your question, your PPA that you've signed up, it's fantastic that you actually have signed up that PPA because that's what's going to help grow the whole industry. But one question, and it's good to hear you're selling, are your prices on your PPA different for the three different time, time slots that you're selling it to? And second part is that how long is your PPA for? And other governments and the finances recognizing the PPA that you have. Sure. So do you want me to go? I, I can. I can. You know, the good news for is that that monopoly has already been broken. My former company, Gale, have entered into an agreement with a company called Chenier in the U.S., where the LNG is going to be purchased at a Henry Hub related price. So, if one company can, you know, there are certain issues in the U.S. that they can allow exports only to countries which are signatories to a FTA. And India is not a signatory. But be that as it may, this monopoly has already been broken. The entry barrier on the regas side is being broken by people like him. So I think there is a lot of change that is going to come about in the gas market in India. Sorry, I, the part two of your question was, uh, uh, I think you're your first part was about the different times of day. Uh, oh, no, the pricing, incidentally, the pricing is the same. We are giving it to them at the same price. It's so what we've tried to do is our units that we generate, rather than saying your 85% PLF that you provide 
you will provide it on a on a basis where you're shut down for 42 days in a year or how many ever days in a year you need to be shut down. Instead of that, what we are providing them is that we are up 100%, uh, 80%, 70%, 90%. So that the blended average of that becomes 85% in terms of units generated. So the fixed charge gets a portion, and the variable charge also gets a portion in that. Manner. So it's a it's a flat charge which comes to about five and a half, almost about five and a half rupees. But they get majority of it in the peak times of the day, and little of it in the night times. We are not getting peak pricing. We are getting slightly where well. We are getting our 15.5% return. We're getting nothing else. We don't get an additional amount for doing that. But the discom has to pay a little more because it's LNG based. So, so that's something that they have to live with and we have to live with. Can we quickly go to one more, one more question, please? Yeah, go ahead. You talked about the scarcity of uh, you know, capacity at the terminals yeah. because of which we need more terminals. Yeah. But why should this scarcity actually affect supplies? Because in today's world, we have technologies wherein ships carrying uh, uh, LNG, you know, can have those liquefaction facilities and Mr. Banerjee himself during his, you know, as the chairman Gale, had talked about this concept. You're, you're absolutely so right. So why should we have, like, you know, put in so much of money and set, set up these huge facilities when we have those kind of I, technologies? I, I, and I'll tell you the simple economics of it. It's not as easily done. We did a lot of surveys into, this, uh, into these uh, regasification ships that you're talking about, FSRUs, they're highly talked about. Petronet's doing one uh, in Gangawaram. Uh, and I'll give you this, the simplest economics that you can get. In an onshore facility on the tanks, we have a concept. They are, they are LNG stored at minus 163 degrees Celsius. That's the, degree, that's the temperature at which it remains liquid. How do we keep it cold? There are no cryogenic facilities. We allow the more energetic molecules to boil off every day. So, 0.05% of gas is boiled off every day from an LNG bunker onshore. On a floating vessel, it is 0.15% every day. So you lose three times as much of gas in boil off, 0.1. 0.2, on the marine side, your cost of operations are far higher. So we did studies. Having floating units and having land-based units, the del while, while you can do your floating unit 12 months earlier than land-based terminals, your cost or the economics support the land-based terminal within as early as two years' time. So the floating terminals for a country like India, in my opinion, don't make any sense. Well, the last one, Jain. Yes. Sir. Jain Dev from Indian Energy Exchange. I support whatever has been proposed by them, that almost 20-25% of our energy basket should contain gas, mostly from LNG sector. Uh, this plant also can be used as emergency supply, apart from picking plant by islanding, the whatever happened three weeks back will not happen again with this kind of plants. Most important part, we have been studying the feasibility of putting up a power, gas exchange for the last 40 years. We found, apart from the terminal monopolies, there is a monopoly of pipelines. And that is one of the impediments for development of the power of the gas exchanges. So any thoughts on this? Uh, actually, I was listening with great interest on in the discussion on open access of the transmission lines. It so happens that the Ministry of Petroleum and Natural Gas has not the, learned the lessons from the Ministry of Power. Theoretically, if you see the Act, uh, Petroleum Natural and Natural Gas Regulatory Act, it talks about open gas, open access. In other words, anybody should be able to move his gas through the pipeline system. Unfortunately, the actual operational aspect of it leaves much to be desired. We have raised these issues a couple of times with the chairman of the regulatory board as well as with the uh, Ministry of Petroleum and Natural Gas. And from what I understand, that this issue will get resolved and uh, gas purchasers will have the freedom and flexibility of open access irrespective of whether the gas pipeline is owned by Gale or Reliance. I just had one, sorry, just one thing to add to that, uh, if I may, is in India, we are stuck with other people's pricing because we don't have our exchange. We need to have lots of regasification capacity. There have to be hundreds of contracts. The market will become liquid and available. So I'd encourage anybody who's willing to work on a gas exchange, 
we'll, we'll assist you in any way in giving you slots at our terminal, giving other people slots and, and speaking to them. But that's the only future for India is if we become uh, a market that it has a lot of contracts, spot, medium term, long term, a great number. Sorry, we, we need to wrap it up here. I think I've already got two signals. If you need to ask questions after this session, gentlemen on my both sides will be there. Answer them in private. That's standard practice we as journalists also follow. If you miss out in press conference, grab him in the corner. So thank you very much for your time, Mr. Banerjee and Mr. Nandan. Thank you. Thank you indeed.